All right, folks, in this chapter, we'll be looking at uh, how geologists basically kind of look at and interpret the earth and uh, some of the techniques and stuff that we use here, right? So oops. let's take a look first at this rock outcrop here, right? Big stack of rock in front of us, right? Uh, and let's take a look at some of the different types of features we see in this rock. Um, and then I'll kind of point out to you some of the things that I see here, right? Now, each different discipline, right, you know, trains you a little bit differently at how to look at things. So hopefully after this, you'll be able to, to see things a little bit more like a geologist, right? Let's look here. We have a, a hill that has several different parts, right? We got this little kind of little peakity guy up here, right? We got this big rock unit in here, right? We got this uh, pretty solid looking unit right here, right? And then we have a uh, at the bottom, you know, loose slope of material you know rock has been covered by by stuff that's uh, uh just kind of loose and broken up here right these red ledges reflect different layers of rock or sometimes we call them beds or units right uh and these are you know might be due to to, to different variations in you know weathering chemical or physical right there's various colorations right different colors to different rock units Some of the colors here, like this, this, this brown and black crap here, look to be kind of more of a stain on the rock than than maybe actually part of the original rock itself, right? All these big cracks, which we call fractures, that are running through the rock, right? They all seem to be very kind of lined up with each other, right? We'll notice a bunch of different fractures in these different rocks as well, and these rocks tend to look more fractured than these rocks. We have rounded corners, we have angular corners, right? That may indicate variations in something. Again, loose pieces of rock on the ground versus solid bedrock, right? These loose pieces tend to cover this rock that's kind of, you know, reddish here. Right? Now, if I were to make kind of a geological sketch of this, you know, kind of go back looking here, right? Here's kind of what I would come up with in my in my sketchbook, right? So uh, at the top, we see, you know, right where we have that very, you know, highest part, we have number one in there, right? Looks to be kind of a separate unit. If you look below that, right, this tends to be more reddish. We might have a, a difference here. It's got a little more white in there, so maybe we'll call that a separate layer, right? This big red unit will all kind of group as, as one layer, right? And then this last down here, the last two, right? We have these big kind of, you know, massive looking, you know, less fractured set of rock here. And then at the bottom we have, you know, rock, but then it's covered by, uh, by some loose material, right? So here's kind of what I would draw up, right? We'd see colors... You know, we could use colors or, you know, distinctions to, ver you know, to, to show us the, the different units, right? We can show layers by kind of marking them out here, right? Little layers that we see or stringers that go through there, right? We can draw in those fractures to show that, indeed, they are, you know, pretty lined up to each other in some sense or another, right? We got that loose material covering the, the slopes, right? So this is kind of maybe you know, a geological sketch of that outcrop, right? Now let's do the same thing with this landscape, right? Taking a look here, what do we notice, right? Whoops. Well, first of all, I notice, let's start kind of maybe at the top again. This top part, we seem to have kind of a, a wavy, almost undulating, looks like a surface that has lots of little tiny you know layers or beds in it right we call those again layers or beds or units right uh, and then below that we get to you know another big kind of blocky like we saw in the last one you know uh, set here we'd maybe see some some fractures or cracks or joints in the rock there but then at the base here we start to you know kind of gradually fade it looks like back into into those those kind of thinner beds right and then here for sure we have really different than you know beds right these look quite a bit different seems like you know the slope on a lot of these is even changing this these forms kind of the slope or these are much steeper right if we look in the back here we can see that you know it looks kind of like we have the same thing repeated uh looks like we have those those 
you know, thinner layers on top, big, thick, chunky layer that starts to fade into, right? And then uh, we see, again, loose material sitting on top of a slope that's probably comprised of the same material that makes up this slope here, right? So kind of looking back at drawing that, that's what you would see here, right? So we would have that, that top layer kind of set up, right, as, and this one isn't exactly lined up, sorry about that, right? We have that top layer and we could denote all those different little beds in there, right? Uh, and then we kind of, you know, continue to us on on the other side, and there's that upper tan layer on there as well, right? See, no, we don't see it here as much, but we see it over here, upper kind of tan or whitish layer, right? And then again, that, that same kind of denotation for that same bed, which probably continues you know, around this, this cliff here, right? That reddish brown cliff with those big fractures, not very many beds, right? And then again, they're very highly bedded down at the bottom, right? We've also noticed that this view is looking north. It's important to, you know, put some sort of, uh, um, um, you know, orientation on there as well. I mean, obviously, you know, if you were just drawing this in your notebook, it wouldn't be drawn to scale or anything, but it'd be good representation. You got loose material here again, angular blocks that have probably fallen off of here, right? But uh, that's, uh, you know, again, just another way to kind of view the different different aspects of these, these, uh, these features, right? So does this ch sketch, again, change the way you look at the photograph, right? So here again is the photograph. And then here's the sketch, right? Again, like I said, you know, each different discipline and each, you know, uh, career and, you know, uh, your own experiences kind of shape the way that, that you view and interpret the world. Uh, but from a geologist's perspective, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that are, are fundamental. So hopefully we're cluing you in a little bit here, right? So now let's take a look at this little exposure of rocks, all right? So what do we notice here? Well, first thing we notice, we have a little BIC or, um, you know, magic marker over here for scale. And we all kind of know what the size of a magic marker is. So a lot of these rocks are about, you know, as long as a magic marker, right? So size is something we'll notice. Whoops, right? Um, what are some other observations we could make uh, from this picture here, right? Well, let's look at the rock itself, right? So this rock seems to be made out of a bunch of other smaller rocks right all of these rocks look like they vary quite a bit in size it's a bunch of different colors so maybe there are different types of rocks in here all mixed together right but then i also see some areas in between these bigger chunks of rock where it looks like you know, there's, there's maybe even some mud or some sand that's been, you know, welded into this rock, right? So this rock appears to be made of other rocks. Right? So let's look at that picture again, and here it is in kind of a, a smaller detail, right? Um, and let's look at this uh, from the perspective of, of kind of a modern day scenario. So here are real live rocks in the wild for today, right? And then here's, you know, our, our rock made out of other rocks, right? So which of these two environments does this top picture look more like, right? Does it look like this one over here or this one over here? Now, looking at the characteristics, right? Now these are both, you know, bigger chunks of rock mixed with smaller chunks of rock, right? But one of the first things you notice is that these rocks are much more round and smooth looking. These are pointy and blocky and angular looking, right? Well, let's look at our picture here. These tend to be fairly round and smooth looking, right? So thinking we're looking more like, like this sort of environment of deposition, if you will, right? And the difference is this, this kind of is found here. This is found on a steep mountain front, right? These rocks are just kind of broken off the mountain and fallen and kind of collected at the base, right? And these rocks uh, represent, are found in, in a, a river that, that contains pebbles and sand and all that sort of stuff, right? So this is all data that we can use, and then we can use that data to do interpretations, right? So if I were to interpret this rock, I would say it looks a lot more like this river rock. So perhaps it had something to do with this rock being deposited in a river or some sort of some sort of water related environment, right? And now I said data 
and interpretation, right? So what is the difference, right? Well, data, first of all, it's observations, right? These are facts, right? They're not up for dispute. They're, they're facts. They're, they're numbers. They're relationships. And they can be expressed as, as qualitative data and as quantitative data. And we'll get to what those two are in just a moment here, right? Uh, on the other hand, interpretation, right? This interpretation uses data to interpret what is, will, did happen, right? This is the land of predictions here, right? So it's always important to, to separate data and interpretation, right? So uh, data in this last picture, for example, would be, you know, these rocks are, you know, roundish. There's variations in size. Uh, there's some sand sized particles, some, some, you know, pebble sized particles, right? Uh, my interpretation of would be then that this is the river, right? That's, you know, saying that this is a river, you know, this was deposited in a river. Uh, that is not data, that is interpretation. But, you know, all those other observations, facts, you know, relationships, those are uh, data, right? Thinking back to, to our nature of science, data, this is the land of scientific laws, right? This is, we know this, these, you know, particular things, right? We know that, you know, universal gravitational law is, uh, uh, you know, dictates, you know, how far away from you are from a body and with its mass, how, you know, much attraction happens and all this good stuff, right? Here on Earth, that boils down to about, you know, and uh, a force of 9.8 meters per second squared, right? Um, so if you drop something, it's going to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared here on Earth. That varies in other places, right? But uh, the, the, but gravity, even though we have the law of gravity, gravity is still, again, a theory because why gravity, right? What's the why behind it, right? Well, these might be these little things called gravitrons. Well, how do they work, right? That's the interpretation part, right? This is where we have our hypotheses, our theories, and our models, right? So this is the land of interpretation and prediction. This is the land of facts and observations, right? So looking at the two different types of data we have, we have qualitative and quantitative data, right? So let's make some observations about this photograph, right? What do we see, right? We can do qualitative data, right? Which are descriptions we can make with words or sketches, right? We see loose, sandy looking material and then blocky material here. Up ahead, we see that this stuff appears to be uh, you know, steaming or smoking or venting, right, in some sort of words, right? Uh, we can notice that this is you know, kind of a reddish tannish color, whereas this rock tends to look a little blacker, right? All of this is qualitative data. It's useful data, but you can't, you know, subtract, you know, this rock from that rock to get a, you know, a different rock. It just doesn't, you know, work like that. That is quantitative data, right? Numeric measurements, right? Conveyed with numbers, right? Things you can add and subtract and multiply, right? So color over here, I said, you know, red or whatever, that's kind of, that is qualitative data. But we could also make that quantitative by putting, you know, a specific spectrum to it, you know, 570 nanometers or whatever, right? Not all data can be translated from qualitative to quantitative, though, right? In the last uh, 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 chapter, we looked at density versus weight in our lab, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, looking kind of at, 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 you know, the same kind of principles here, right? So what can we look at uh, between density of these three blocks, whoops, emerged in water, right? So what kind of inferences, right, or, or uh, um, interpretations can we make about, uh, or inferences can we make about these blocks, right? Well, if water again, 1.0 gram per cubic centimeter. If this thing is floating, it must be less than, right? If this thing is sunk, it must be more than, right? Denser than. And then this little block in the middle is kind of floating, you know, neutrally buoyant in there. That probably is water, you know, same density as water, right? Density again is a mass divided by a volume. Essentially, it's a measure of how much stuff is packed into that space, how many, you know, protons and neutrons basically are packed into a space, right? Electrons have very little weight. We'll talk about that in a couple chapters. But uh, so density, essentially, how much stuff is shoved into that 
that particular space, right? Again, less dense, right? Less mass per volume, more dense, more mass per volume, right? Now, the thing we didn't discuss is the difference between density and weight or mass and weight, right? There is a difference, right? So mass is basically, again, a measure of, of how much, uh, uh, how many neutrons and stuff are, or protons and, and neutrons are, are in an object, right? But not divided by the volume. So uh, the difference is uh, mass does not include the force of gravity into the calculations. Weight, on the other hand, does include the force of gravity uh, onto uh, the calculations, right? So looking at this, right, standing on Earth or standing on the moon, right, the moon is a much smaller body, it has much less gravitational pull, right, but the person standing here has the exact same mass because they have the exact same amount of stuff in their body, right? Um, their density would, would also not change because their volume wouldn't change, hopefully. Uh, anyway, uh, but because of the difference in the gravitational attraction of the moon being less, right, you have a, a la lower weight on the moon, even though your mass is still the same, which is why you can hit a golf ball forever and jump super high when you're on the moon and all that good jazz, right? Uh, as we make geological observations and write them down and try to, you know, present this data and information to other folks, you know, uh, there's a few different ways we do it, and here's a couple of common ones. We have block diagrams and you'll see some of these in this class kind of looks like a big you know three-dimensional cut of the earth and you'll see you know the different layers or beds in there we have a cross section that just kind of cuts across you'll start from point a and going to point b right including the topography and all the layers right and then the third one here is a stratigraphic section that just shows the sequences of rocks from bottom going up and up and up towards the top so let's infer kind of the sequence of events that form this area, right? Let's look. Well, you know, there's this one has to have been here, right? Can't put something on it if there's, you know, nothing below it. So we must have the oldest layers on bottom going younger on that, younger on that, younger on that. And then at some point, a stream cut a valley through this whole thing and cutting it, right? In the, the next chapter, we'll get more into sequence of events and all sorts of fun stuff like that, right? In this, uh, the lab, uh, going with this chapter, we'll be looking at uh, maps and, and topographic maps. Uh, we'll be using Google Earth Pro quite a bit. Um, and uh, just a couple things to point out. There are some differences in the way we describe some of these uh, features related to topography, right? First of all, we have elevation, and elevation is dictated the height above, you know, some datum. And the datum we use on our topographic lap, maps is mean sea level. So when you see elevations, right, that is done in mean sea level. For example, a lot of places around here in Michigan, we're around, you know, six or 500 feet elevation, right? Now that is different than relief, right? Relief is the difference in height between two different locations, right? So the difference between the elevation of these two locations. Subtract this one from this one and you'll get the relief, right? So there might be 400 feet of relief between, you know, this top of this mount or mountain and the, this hill here, right? But that, that might be different than, you know, its elevation, right? And the third thing to look at is steepness of slope. And this is usually measured down from a horizontal or flat, right? So the steeper the slope, right the steeper the angle right and that is the slope basically you know of the the surface of of the land right this is what we call the, the slope right there are several different types of maps used in geology uh, um, and they are used to do you know different types of data visualization and depiction right the one seen here is a shaded relief map of a little area down in Arizona it's got lots of volcanoes right one we'll be playing with a lot is a topographic map, right, and different elevation contours. You get to learn all about those in the lab this week, right, of the same area. Right? Then of the same area, you also have satellite images, right. Or we can do geologic maps as well, and these are taking maps and putting the geology 
uh, on them. The different, you know, say we have lava flows, scoria cones, cinder cones, limestone, marking all these different units or beds or layers uh, as where they outcrop and where you can see them exposed on the surface. So some of the observations we might make, let's say kind of just, you know, finishing this up here, here's Yellowstone Park or Yellowstone uh, Lake in Yellowstone National Park, right? Some things we've been observing lately, you know, there's an area around this end of the lake, the north end of the lake, north is that way for some reason, right? Uh, that seems to be right, that is rising, right? That's data, that's observation, that's fact. Observation, right? Flooded trees on the opposite side of the lake, that's data and that's fact, right? But what are some of the possible interpretations that might go along with this, right? Well, one of the interpretations you could make is that the whole land area is kind of tilting, maybe, right? And kind of dumping the lake, moving it from that side to that side, right? Another, uh, you know, interpretation could be that, that this little area where we have that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that rising, you know, maybe just that area is rising and it's kind of pushing the water over this direction, right? So a couple different interpretations, right? So I hope you enjoyed this and hope you have fun playing with topographic maps.